Diolch Chris, uh, Crystal can a shiny pow, um, I ran uh, around the day to Natsir Gogoth Cymru. Uh, then he can have a scourse of my uh, Velran or with Nos and with the Eth when all the Eth did on. Um, I'm on Plesser, I've ranked E. Gashi Krasawi, Edward Mayer, so Mindy, Fanny, a well a decaith, a Vlaim Rieth, a Drevol, a when all the Eth did on. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome wherever you are. Um, on behalf of North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, we're hosting this webinar as part of the um, Swift Awareness Week, which is about celebrating the joy of Swifts, uh, alerting people to their decline and the reasons for it, and also hopefully inspiring them to take action uh, on, on behalf of Swifts. And uh, just to give you a bit of background about us, what we've been trying to do, we've been trying to do that really, trying to help Swift for about seven, six or seven years. Um, we realized that they were a species in, in, in trouble, um, but we thought sort of naively at the time, we'd just try and help them by putting up some boxes and it would all be fine. Uh, of course, it's not as simple as that. And uh, it's quite a, a long process we've found and quite, quite um, sometimes quite difficult to persuade them to jump into boxes. Although we have had some, some recent success, which has been nice. I was out on, uh, Saturday in Menai Bridge and we, it was wonderful to see um, of some boxes that we put up about five years ago uh, we now have eight out of nine boxes occupied by Swift which is fantastic and makes us think it's worth carrying on um, but we also realized fairly early on that we if we were going to try and help Swifts which were declining for sure uh, we needed more data so we we tried to set up we worked with Covnod which is the North Wales uh, local record centre and set up a special recording page. And um, by the way, if you are, if you're joining us from North Wales, please keep sending in those records onto the Swift Recovery uh, webpage. But, uh, you know, we gathered that information. We also tried to raise awareness locally and work with schools and groups and organised events like the Swift Half, which, um, which was popular, combining watching Swifts with uh, socializing and we also have been you know trying to campaign and especially recently we've, we've really tried to link when we ever we talk about decline of swifts that we talk about decline of insects as well because we feel that it's highly unlikely that those two things are unconnect, unconnected but all through that that journey for us for the north wales wildlife trust of, of trying to help swifts there's been a constant source of um, information inspiration uh, advice, encouragement, and that's been Edward Mayer. Um, and that's both in person through when we've gone to him directly for, for help with uh, projects or questions, but also through the, um, the wonderful website that he set up in 2003, I think it was the, the, the uh, Swift Conservation website, which if you're interested in Swift, I think it's, it's an absolute must. It's got uh, a fantastic collection of information advice um and if you you know it's all the different kinds of swift boxes and uh um, sound kit and cds and uh books and everything is is there uh, as well as lots of really great practical advice so please go along to to edward's um website um a little bit about edward i you know i have only met edward briefly in flesh at, uh, at the swift conference but uh I've, I've read that, you know, I've, or I've heard Edward talking about the first time that he, very, very beautifully talking about the, the first time that he kind of fell in love with, with Swift, which was when he was, I think it was six years old, I'm not sure, uh, he'll, he'll, perhaps he'll tell us in a minute, um, but it's clear, you know, when you, when you do hear him speak that he, he's somebody who's managed to keep that, that childlike um, wonder and passion for Swift and you know, and he's and he talks about that the the unearthliness of Swift, which I think is that that's a spot on word for for that kind of combination of beauty, but also strangeness that the Swifts have. Um, but he's he's also you know he's had a, a career um, as the head of gallery management for the Tate, which sort of sounds like a very demanding job. But you know, when you hear him speak, I think I think you'll hear a little bit of his his understanding of the dynamics of how people interact with with architectural space and the built environment and how wildlife can as well of course but you know I think he really brings a quite a deep understanding of 
of that. And, um, and also like Swift, he's, he's very, he seems to be a very international person and he has lots of connections with lots of different parts of the world. And he researched Swift's a lot in, in Germany, I think, but he's also um, campaigned in other countries and, and been educating and inspiring people all over the place. And also helped to organize the, the international Swift conferences, which have happened in different countries. Um, and he's clearly someone that really believes that uh, the built environment can be better and that Swifts can be part of it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing his talk and I'm gonna stop talking myself now. And, um, and let, I'm just looking forward to hearing what Edward has to say and, and, and to hearing some of your questions at the end. So I think I'll just pass over now to Edward. Jochmar, Edward, um, Kreuzer, over to you. Uh, Edward, you need to unmute. <laughs> is that better now? Can you that hear me? Better. Yes. Good. The host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Let's hope this works. Okay. okay. Right. We're going to start. <clears throat> and here we are, slideshow. Oh, current slide. Okay. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Yes, I was six years old when I first saw my first swifts, first birds I ever, ever noticed as birds, I think. Um, there, there was a blackbird singing outside my window. I do remember that as well. But swifts were the thing. And I've been asked tonight to sort of merge two themes, which is urban biodiversity, which is one of the things I lecture on increasingly now. And swifts which of course are a key part of urban biodiversity so we're going to start off with this um hybrid talk swifts a vision of urban biodiversity and you'll see an amazing structure on the first slide which is a giant complex in seville new made mostly out of wood and um, uh, designed, I think, by a Finnish architect to fill the ancient slaughterhouse area, which was knocked down and then became fairly unpleasant part of town. And then they came up with a scheme to turn it into something, a sort of pleasure dome area of Seville. And here it is. And you'll find out why it's included later on. Now, why help wildlife? people who help wildlife and like wildlife are often sort of put down as um, uh, sort of weirdos or sentimental fools or people who like cute animals or people who are obs obsessed with Disney type um, uh, uh, movies. Well, no, no, it's not that at all. We're helping wildlife because our survival depends on it. And to quote this professor from Stanford University, our civilization depends utterly on the plants, animals, and microorganisms that supply it with essential ecosystem services, ranging from pollination, crop protection, to supplying food from the sea and maintaining a livable climate. And here we have one example. People often go on and on and on about bees, 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 when they mean honeybees. And honeybees are a, a Southeast Asian imported species that gets through our winter, winters with difficulty. When we talk about bees, we mean wild bees, bees that are here already, not farmed bees like honeybees. And here is a leafcutter bee, a solitary species that is spectacularly good at pollinating. You see, it's 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 thorax, no, it's not the thorax, abdomen there. You see this this part. See how the underside is totally covered in pollen. It's an incredibly efficient pollinator. Now. The grim side, the grim news, is that whatever you may think of politicians and our government, they failed. The UK government has failed to meet straightforward United Nations objectives. UK government has failed on 17 out of 20 biodiversity targets agreed in Japan in 2010. The 2019 State of Nature report found that populations of the UK's most important wildlife had fallen by 60% in 50 years. It also showed that government funding for biodiversity was 0.02% of UK gross domestic product, which is round about the money I get on my savings these days. And public sector investment 
in conservation has fallen in real terms by 33% in the past five years. And it is affecting everything. Here are three species at the bottom, a sandwich tern, a lapwing, and a curlew, all of whom are in savage decline for a variety of reasons. Changes to farming, changes to fishing, over-exploitation of the seas, uh, climate change, um, and um, changes in agricultural use. Uh, all of them are things that we can do something about, or should have done something about, and all of them are combined to take down three species that used to be terribly common, but aren't, and many other creatures are similarly affected. Meanwhile, unfortunately, we're wiping out our world, and you cannot put it too strongly. Entomologists in Germany found out that between 89 and 2013, the biomass of invertebrates caught in traps fell by nearly 80%. That is simply stunning. A very short period, 80% of the invertebrates are wiped out. And this is probably down to changes in farming. Um, Professor Dave Goulson of Sussex University did a very simple survey back in, 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 in about 2014, I think. He interviewed local farmers and got them to give him their lists of what they sprayed on their crops of oilseed rape. And he found one farmer um, who had treated a single crop of oilseed rape 22 times with insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, herbicide, fungicide, molluscicide, herbicide, fungicide, fungicide, fertilizer, fungicide, fertilizer, fertilizer, fungicide, insecticide, fungicide, fungicide, insecticide, insecticide. Well, what's left? After you've sprayed your crop 22 times, what is left in the way of life in there? I mean, these, these products, they're, they're not jokes, you know, they're not con tricks. They do what it says on the tin. They kill, they kill insects, they kill, um, um, what are they called, um, fungi, um, they kill plants. And the crop is bred uh, to resist the chemicals, but, Everything else is just going to die. And so what do you get in a crop like this feeding on? What's left? Well, things that feed directly on the crop, like wood pigeons. They'll go in there and they'll eat the oilseed rape seeds and some of the foliage. And then what else do you get? Well, you'll get the predators like crows, rooks, buzzards, seagulls that move in to eat everything that is killed by the sprays or dies a lingering death from the sprays and wriggles around a bit, gets eaten up by the crows, or, um, or, 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 or else um, actually eats the crop itself. So you've got, you've got, oh, I don't, I'm sorry, I almost forgot. You get the things like small creatures that get incapacitated by the sprays and then get eaten, up, sort of chopped up by the farm machinery. And then you get the birds like the gulls and the crows coming in to eat the chopped up frogs and chopped up caterpillars that have been cut by the farm machinery. So basically you have a, 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 the, the, a sort of zero biodiversity feel. I mean, you get, might get three or four species of birds in there, wood pigeons, gulls, um, uh, crows and, 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 and rooks maybe. You know, it's probably going to be about it on a whole huge chunk of land. And we're doing the same in the tropics, I'm afraid. I mean, you may have seen that Iceland Foods is refusing to use palm oil. Iceland supermarkets are refusing to use palm oil or tolerate palm oil in any of their products to save orangutans. And you sort of look at this scenario here. This is in Sumatra. And you just, you just think, my God, how didn't they do it? I mean, how much fuel did they use? Just trashing entire miles upon miles of countryside to extract this wood and then to grow palm oil. You, 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 you cannot begin to comprehend the level of destruction that humans are waging against the planet. I mean, look at it here. It just goes from 1900, or well, from 1950, starts to rocket. Now, in looking at all this horror, we are forgetting how nature can help us personally. This is a picture from a local local garden near where I live, Great Dixter Gardens in East Sussex, absolutely beautiful, beautiful gardens. Now, why, why should we have all, 
bother with beautiful gardens and beautiful landscape? Well, there's one very good reason. A quarter of the population are on psychoactive drugs. And I don't mean ones they buy in pub toilets. I mean ones prescribed by their doctors. UK government figures show that between 2017 and 2018, 26% of the adult population were prescribed psychoactive drugs used for treating sleeplessness, depression and anxiety. Spending time in the natural environment, whether as a resident or a visitor, improves our mental health and feelings of well-being. It can reduce stress, fatigue, anxiety and depression. It can help boost immune systems, encourage physical activity, may reduce the risk of chronic diseases. It can combat loneliness, and bind communities together. And that's from the UK government's A Green Future, a 25-year plan to improve the environment. Now, it's quite a situation when a quarter of the population adult population have to take drugs to get through the every day. Sleeplessness, depression and anxiety. We haven't got a war on. Our parents, my parents, grandparents went through two world wars, infinite amount of financial decline and trouble. And the, popula the population, I mean, quarter of the population weren't taking drugs then. So what is so wrong with our lives? We have to drug ourselves to get through them or a substantial portion of the population does. And could it be that we are becoming more and more divorced from the real world? Green space is feeling good. Now, there's this very neat bit of research by Dr. Vicky Holden of Newcastle University. She asked 25,000 Londoners, about their life satisfaction, self-worth, happiness, and she matched it, their results, their answers to their postcodes. So she could work out how far they were from a green space. And very satisfyingly, the further they were from a green space, garden park, nice green spaces, little village greens, that sort of thing, further away they were, the worse they felt. You can see on the graph, people a kilometre away from a green space felt ghastly, and the people within 300 metres of a green space felt pretty good. It's very neat and it's very interesting. Wildlife can also help, as well as with mental issues, it can help reduce insect-borne diseases too. Natural controls, insect-eating birds and bats really do control disease-carrying insects like mosquitoes, gnats and flies, also agricultural pests like aphids. This is becoming more and more important as with our global travel and global businesses, alien diseases and alien mosquitoes are moving into Europe. We've got this brand new mosquito, the tiger mosquito, which is tiny and has moved from Southeast Asia, where it occupies forest canopies, to places like Italy and the south of France and Greece, where it lives low level, in, breeds in puddles and litter filled with water, that sort of thing. It's active by night and day. It's a very nasty mosquito and um, uh, it's a vector for disease. We also have three new insect carried diseases in the Mediterranean area now. Dengue has arrived in Egypt and chikungunya has arrived some years ago from the Caribbean and caused several outbreaks in the Mediterranean countries like Italy. It has the same sort of symptoms as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's very, very painful. So is dengue. Dengue is an exceptionally painful disease affecting the joints. And then there's a final one, West Nile virus, which can actually kill you, which was accidentally introduced into the USA from um, the Middle East and then came back from the USA to infect Italy. Um, that is, all three diseases are incurable. They can be treated with palliatives, but they're incurable. And there are no vaccines for them. And so, um, West Nile virus can kill you. Dengue can too in certain forms, though it's rare. Now, they're probably just a forerunner of huge numbers of new diseases that are going to come into our countries as the rainforests are destroyed and creatures living in the rainforests move out and move into farms and human habitations and bring new diseases with them. It's already happened in Malaysia with bat diseases infecting pigs who then infected humans. Um, we're going to see a lot more COVID type events, I think. And if we keep the wildlife around us that eats these creatures, we're, we've got a chance. 
if we wipe it all out, then we're just going to get the diseases and they're going to thrive and thrive and thrive with no natural controls. Why urban areas really matter now for wildlife? Well, research by the University of Sheffield shows that urban areas in the UK now hold more species than the countryside. Not surprising when you see what's happening to the countryside in terms of spraying and chemical input. In fact, our urban areas, whether we know it or not, have become nature reserves, the last safe places for many species. Um, and here is a photograph from Bilbao, a town, a port town in, 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 in the north of Spain, which has made huge efforts to green the town. And here is a row of extremely dramatic green wall, but it shows how you can slap habitat right up over and around buildings in an imaginative and attractive way and provide habitat for wildlife. And birds like this swift, will move in to any holes, nest boxes you put up. So it's worth thinking very hard about your environment. One example of just how things are developing here in the UK is trees. Our towns and cities now have far more trees than our rural areas. And in fact, Camden and Croydon, two boroughs you wouldn't expect to be like this, and Camden keeps getting criticised for its terrible tree management and it's now officially the filthiest borough in the UK because it has more fly tipping incidents than anywhere else in the UK. So Camden is nothing special. But Camden and Croydon have about 30% tree cover. It's amongst the best in the UK. And then you compare it with the countryside. Down below is Lincolnshire. Admittedly, I've picked one of the worst photographs I can find. That's Lincolnshire, where you can hardly see a tree. George Monbiot calls it a chemical desert because it is just one great mass of chemical based farming. And you can see the result. Um, not much is going to be able to live there. Whereas in Camden, with the trees and the gardens, an awful lot more environment is created. The answer, of course, is to build in biodiversity to our built building sites, to our built environment. I mean, by 2030, most of the population will live in towns. I'm not sure that COVID is gonna drive that many people out to the countryside. I think they'll find it quite tough in terms of educating their children, driving huge distances, all that sort of thing. I think, I think people will basically stick to towns. We know that living in urban areas with no trees, no green places, and wildlife is bad for our physical and mental health. Application of urban biodiversity concepts can reverse this. And you can see this in the Barbican here. The Barbican, which I saw being built in the 1970s, so I worked just next to it, was sold as new brutalism, brutalism, brutalist concrete. It was going to be tough, 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 just grey concrete forms and shapes. Well, People didn't like that much. Now, when I first saw the Barbican, none of this green was here. The water was here, sure. This fountain thingy, rather nice thing, was here too, but there was no planting. But people changed that. People started gardening clubs and growing things all along their balconies. And then the management of the art center here, concert hall, theaters, library, realised that if they were going to get people in and get them to stay, it had to look nicer. It couldn't just look like a concrete jungle where you sort of expect to get graffiti and mugging and drug dealers behind every pillar. Uh, it had to look nice and nice meant green and green meant planting. So they put in reed beds, they put in these little features full of plants and they put in trees and Fellas like this coot turned up and started breeding. And the last time I walked past here, there was a gray heron standing on the end. So there's fish and there's loads of these lovely wagtails flitting around. And there's other things coming in too. There's lots of ducks and they're all wild. They all just wandered in and they live here. And it's much, much nicer. And people over this side where the theaters and the concert halls are, people sit outside and have cafes, cafes and there's food and there's nice places to sit and you can hear the waterfall and you can smell nice, smells green and pleasant. So it was greened and it's much, much nicer for everybody and everything. How do you do it? 
Well, we push for simple, practical, low cost, low risk ideas. Don't try and build a kingfisher nest place. It probably won't work. A sand martin bank, well, might work, probably won't. You know, you have to really pick your sites carefully for those and have a lot of expert advice and a lot of money. Whereas just by letting ivy grow up the side of a building, like here in Kentish Town, ivy and Virginia creeper, you don't have to do much to it. I had a huge wall at the Tate, the back of the Tate, covered in Virginia creeper, which I inherited, only had to clip it at the top twice a year when we were cleaning the roof anyway. We were cleaning all the roof gullies, so we went up on the roof, we clipped the Virginia creeper at the top. That's all we had to do. Um, sweep up the leaves, that was it. And then ivy, fantastic for wildlife, absolutely fantastic for supporting many species, it needs virtually no care. And if you've got a decent building, it doesn't harm it. It keeps the water off it and it keeps the snow and ice off it too. And then simple things like Burberry's. Uh, supermarkets love Burberry's for their car parks because it's jolly, brightly coloured, and nobody will nick it because it's thorny. Big problem, people nick plants. And I find a nice plant, they'll drive the car up, get the shovel out and get it into the boot. But Berberis is too prickly and Berberis is fantastic for feeding insects, bees with pollen and nectar, and then birds with the berries. And then a pond. This is an 18th century pond in a French park in Nancy, and they've converted it to be a wildlife pond by making sure the wildlife can get in and out of the water. Often ponds have got a deep rim and the bird can't drink because it can't perch and dip its head without falling in. So it's useless for wildlife and newts and little tiny frogs and creepy crawlies can't get into the water either because of that big rim. But here they've put rocks around the rim and they've put plants in and it's okay for wildlife. You can get in and out, you can drink there. So you're looking really for four essentials, shelter and habitat, native species of plants and trees. Don't have to be that native. They can basically be species that go from the UK to India because plenty of our birds go from UK to India. So you can get a good range of things in, but don't plant New Zealand flax. That's not very helpful to um, Northern, northern uh, old world, birds. Food, natural, not handouts. Don't put out feeders. You'll just get pigeons and rats and complaints. Basically, just put out plants that supply nectar, pollen, fruits and berries and do the job for you. Like this Berberis, like the ivy. You don't need to do any more than that. Water, clean, drinkable, not treated. Now, you may not know this, but if you have a fountain in Britain or in Europe and it sprays into the air, it's got to be treated with bromine or lots of chlorine to stop the possibility of Legionnaire's disease, which means and it won't support wildlife. You'll get these super clean looking fountains like in Trafalgar Square that will look all look blue and lovely, but they won't support microorganisms or even small organisms in the water. Even frogs that get in will die in a few hours from absorbing the uh, biocides through their skins. It's OK for water for pigeons to drink, but nothing else. So try a pond like this. We build an infrastructure. More of that later. Now, just a few examples that I've taken while wandering around the place of all sorts of mini to fairly major greenings. This is in West Hampstead, where I live. It's just down the road from me. The, the local people there have persuaded Camden Council not to pour glyphosate twice a year on the street tree sites. Um, which is saving us some money and avoiding poisoning the land with a known carcinogen. And they're growing their own plants. It looks wonderfully scruffy, but boy, is it fun. It looks, makes the whole street look good. They put any old plants around the trees. Here in Walthamstow village, this is a perennial meadow, meadow sown in 2012 by the local community to celebrate the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. And when my wife walked past, it was just on a vacant lot between some cottages. It was full of grasshoppers. When did you last hear grasshoppers? They've almost vanished. Grasshoppers were zinging away and there were lots of little moths and butterflies flitting around too. We went to Antwerp 
um, uh, on an architectural uh, 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 trip. Um, uh, our, my wife and our other great passion is architecture. And we were staying in a hotel, we looked out the window and zee, they had beehives and they had sedums planted on the roof to feed the bees. And when we looked around with our binoculars, we found that loads of other roofs had beehives and sedums and other things growing. This is in Vienna and it's just opposite one of the main parks, very historic. And here was a huge swath of wild grasses planted in front of their rental bikes. And I think it's mainly to stop people shoving the bikes onto the street and getting splattered by a tram, you know, looking the wrong way. Um, but as well as a safety feature, of course, it's great for it's great for urban wildlife and it's great for freshening up the air. Now, to go sort of mega, photograph this from the top of one of the main art galleries in Lisbon. I'm not sure if it's the art gallery or next door, actually, but they have the most professional green roof here. Now, Lisbon's quite wet, so it won't need much watering, thank goodness. Won't need to use energy to water it, but what a green roof. And it's part of a sort of series of patchwork, a patchwork of green spots around Lisbon to help connect wildlife corridors. So wildlife can move through Lisbon and get a meal on the way. Now, we move on to Swifts. The icing on the urban cake, frankly, for me, a top predator of flying insects. If you've got swifts around, it shows you've got a healthy habitat with many supportive species underneath. So you've got, you, you've got, you've got swifts at the top and then you've got this pyramid structure going right down to the microorganisms in the earth that the little things feed on and then hatch out into insects and fly up in the air and then the swifts eat them. And here we have some swifts flying over the Welsh hills. Um, so we will start looking at swifts. And this is what swifts do for us. Swifts cheer us up like nothing else. Here are three photographs from Barcelona. Time-lapse photographs showing swifts rocketing through the air. Now, these are grim streets. You may think of Barcelona as fun, 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 bars and the rest of it and having a good time. But for people who live there, these streets can be pretty grim. I mean, your view from your balcony here is just of a wall across the street. Even worse here is of a blank wall across the street. You can't even wave to the neighbours. And you don't get much sunlight, do you? I mean, there's a bit of sunlight at the top here, but they're, they're so narrow, these streets. You, 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 you're, you're shielded from the sun. You're shielded from views. You are locked into a grey cement canyon all the time you're at home. It's not, there's no vista. And then you put up with this all through winter and it's grey and wet and raining and oh, pretty depressing really. And then suddenly one morning in April, something's changed. You wake up and something's changed. You, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? And you whack back the shutters and whomph, the swifts are rocketing up and down the street. They've just come back from Africa. They're keen to breed. They're looking for their old nest places and they transform Barcelona into a whirling mass of action. It's not just drunken tourists dropping bottles in the streets and shouting at 2 a.m. It's wonderful, wonderful swifts rocketing through the air, shooting past you, full of joy and delight and action. The earth is alive. It's like what Ted Hughes says, that oh, the planet is still working. Yeah, that's what you get with swifts. You get it with other wildlife too, but swifts, top top species for bringing joy, action and wonderment to our daily lives. But swifts are in serious trouble too. We're losing swifts at a pretty terrible rate. 58% in 21 years. It's not a lot better anywhere else. In fact, it's worse in Lombardy. But in France, minus 40% since 20, 2005. Era, major loss of breeding areas. Italy, minus 25% in 30 years. Lombardy, 62.5%. That's northern Italy. The most industrialised, most um, uh, uh, managed and renovated part of Italy. Spain, they've lost a third. You can hardly believe it. There's so many Swifts in Spain. But <laughs> Switzerland, species is classified as under threat. Poland, former East Germany, major local losses. Europe, Overall losses of 25%. And you get things like this, demolitions. This is in Antwerp, they knocked down a warehouse where swifts were breeding. Loads of swifts were killed. The uh, 
The owners were fined 80,000 euros. It doesn't bring back the swifts. This is in Poland, where people tried to stop pigeons, put up all these bird spikes. Well, they didn't stop the pigeons. They killed swifts instead. The problems to swifts are really, many of them are down to the fact that they nest in holes and buildings. It's terribly safe as far as avoiding predators, but it's not very good avoiding us. You can see the sort of places they nest. They're being evicted by unsympathetic restoration, anti-bird and bat measures, repairs and insulation. We're becoming squeaky clean. We don't tolerate other species living in our buildings. Birds shouldn't be there, shouldn't be there, it's just for us. And there's money around. There's huge sums of money from the lottery for doing up historic buildings, from the European community for doing up historic buildings and for new ventures. And the new buildings we're replacing old buildings with are useless as they have no suitable holes. They don't have these features. You can't get under the tiles. There are no holes left in the walls. You can't get under the tiles. So new buildings are useless to swifts and bats too, for that matter. Now, what can we do about it? Well, I studied with Erich Kaiser in his home in Kronberg. And I sat in this attic here behind a, behind a dark, in a, behind a perspex screen in a sort of darkened cupboard. And I watched 13 swift nests. Here they are in action. And that's how Erich has studied swifts. Erich studied with David Lack in the swift colony in Oxford, and then went back to Germany and set up his own 90 strong swift colony in the top of his mother-in-law's house. Um, which he later inherited and he drilled holes right through the walls and then connected them up to the inside of the gable and he put fantastic nest boxes on the outside and you can get you can see things like this he could study swifts he proved that swifts could be raised in your house by you and other people copied him rosie Schultz in hanover copied the Oxford colony, she got virtually the same ventilation structure on this uh, Romanesque Gothic church, Romanesque structure, Gothic roofed church, which was rebuilt after being bombed by us in the war. And um, they've got the local kids and some, some adults to make all these nest boxes and they fitted them all around here and up here and along here and see these boxes went here. And these, these, these pale boxes went, went around here. And you can do it. You can just do it. And like so many things, you think you aren't up to it. You think it's not going to work. You think you think you can't change anything. As individuals, you think you can't change anything. Well, um, as individuals, you can change absolutely everything. Think of Napoleon. Think of Lenin. Um, they changed the world massively, you might say monstrously, but they changed it. They were individuals. They persuaded other people to help them. They did it, which means that you can do it too for swifts, for wildlife, for biodiversity, for anything. Don't give up. Just think, think of the people who have changed history. They started as a single person. Ingolf Grabov, he went to the same conference as Rosie Schultz and I. He saw Eric's boxes and he went back to Frankfurt. I started Swift Conservation in London. He went back to Frankfurt and he's created over 2000 nest places by fitting buildings with nest boxes. Now Frankfurt's another example of a building that was I mean, a town that was 70% destroyed by bombing. So the new buildings had nowhere for Swifts to nest. So Ingolf got the permission of big property owners to when they were having the buildings built or re-gutted, he would use the same, he and his team would use the same scaffolding, adopt the same safety measures, have the same safety training and get up there and fit these boxes under, under gutters, under eaves, and they work. This one here had swift in it two years later. Very cheap, very simple. You piggyback on other people's projects, you save all the costs of the access equipment. My friend Martine in Brussels, she was at that same Frankfurt conference and she was inspired too. And she goes around Brussels and Belgium, all of Belgium now, teaching people how to fit 
holes in buildings. Now, Brussels, when I first started going to Brussels, my wife used to work there. Um, and I visited her often and Brussels was very run down in those days. I mean, a lot of the buildings were knackered bits. These soffits were falling off. They were full of holes. They were rotting away. And Swifts were having a good time. And then money started coming in. Money started coming in in a big way from the 70s onwards. Lots of money came in. Europe became really, really, really rich. And they did up all the buildings. Like in London, they did up all the buildings. And so these soffits were replaced with brand new soffits and the Swifts couldn't get in. So Martine goes round and she teaches people like these builders here to drill the right size holes, 65 millimetres by 28 millimetres in the soffits so the Swifts can get in and breed. The Czech Republic, they've picked up the message. Now they've been doing up like everybody else. They've got a huge heritage of 1960s apartment blocks, flats, uh, equivalent to our local council flats. And they've been doing them up, insulating them like we have, though not like Grenfell, they do it a different fireproof way. And um, they slap on external insulation blocks and then plaster over them. And they they found that Swifts were nesting in their, 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 their apartment blocks. So they have given them substitute nest places. They make them out of um, uh, insulated material and they fix them on the outside of the building and they've got schools taking part and schools will make nest boxes like this one here and fit them onto the outside of buildings using an app sailor here to do it they've got 40 schools um this is equivalent to the rspb or bto uh, uh, the czech czechoslovak bird society ornithological society swift nest play scheme and the kids um, they do uh, lessons about migration of all these birds fitted into the curriculum and they learn skills like cutting wood, painting wood, working with wood, all the things that I did at school but um, don't seem to be done much in Britain anymore but here in Czechoslovakia, sorry Czech Republic, they are doing it. Uh, here is the social housing, this is the continuation, I mentioned the social housing being insulated, well they've blocked up the old ventilation holes but they have put in special swift nest boxes made of insulated material sunk into the insulation to replace those lost during works, which is brilliant. Uh, France, um, I helped set up the Ambroise Swift group, um, went over and gave some talks and did some walks and they've gone ahead and rocketed. Um, they've got two terribly charismatic leaders, Carolyn and Tim, who are getting the message right across France and here they've got the local school putting up nest boxes. Just brilliant. Um, here in Toulon, down in the south of France, in the Midi, they've got a fantastic Swift group led by this wonderful lady. Um, and she has got the town of Toulon organized. They, they, the, the Swift group goes out and censuses all the Swifts and then the local authority feeds the information to property owners and says, like, you've got Swifts, you've got a duty to preserve them. France, here's one of Carolyn and Tim's fantastic jobs. They, this beautiful, exquisite little chapel had to be renovated. They got Swift places built into the roof under these hoods. So perfect for Swifts returning, just great. It just shows what you can do. It's a historic building. It's got the highest level of historic protection, but still they were allowed to do this. Netherlands, this is a new build, a multi-story new build and it's an office block, basically, I think. Yeah, oh, is it apartments? No, it's apartments. And they had 100 Swift bricks installed during the building, 75 metres high, that's high. And the first Swifts moved in a year after it was opened. And there you can see them. There's two Swifts zipping around. So you can pop things called Swift bricks into, which are just a hollow brick, basically, into this sort of building. And it's wonderful. This is the Alkmaar Synagogue, a very historic site in Alkmaar, and Swifts were incorporated in this building. It was completely renovated and done up, and Swifts were incorporated in, they've got wooden gutter boxes that hold a copper gutter, and there's space for Swifts underneath the copper gutter, and there they are. They haven't quite finished attaching the drain pipes yet, but here they are. They're the lovely gutter boxes. Again, a, preser a preserved, 
protected historic building and they've allowed SWIFTs to be incorporated into it. Russia, um, again, you've got right across Eastern Europe, just like across Britain, you've got these 1960s council flats, for want of a better word, local government flats. And these are the old gray ones. Now, people like them now. They didn't like them when they went up. They were unpopular. But people like them now because they're big, they're pretty quiet, they're well built, they're solid, and they just need a new bathroom, a new kitchen and some insulation, and they'll be fit for another 100 years, probably. And so one scheme was to paint them bright colours, which in fact they've done all over Eastern Europe, and these places look great now, and put on big bobbly numbers with holes for swifts in. That was one scheme. Well, um, it didn't get built, but it's such a good idea, um, I, I have included it here. England, here are some examples of jobs that I've been involved with or other friends of mine have been involved with. Uh, this was one of my first ever. It's the Swiss Cottage Sports Centre, a Terry Farrell Architects project. Boy, was I glad to get involved in a Terry Farrell job because that gives incredible prestige. I mean, he did the MI5 centre, was it MI6? Can't remember, you know, the one he's blown up in James Bond films. Um, yeah, and um, hey, hey, here we have a Swift brick. This is the first sort of Swift brick ever made, a German one invented about 60, 70 years ago. Um, I've encouraged British manufacturers to make them and there's about eight companies making them in the UK now. So um, we can buy homegrown ones and you can get them for about 20, 30 pounds each now. Um, but here they are in the Swiss Cottage Sports Centre and they are hidden, hidden behind the plaster. They just got the hole there. Um, this is the Brighton NHS Trust and a different sort of Swift brick. This is um, the EcoServe Swift brick made to match your building. Whatever your building's made of, if it's Portland stone, marble, uh, brick, terracotta brick or yellow brick or white brick, they will make them to match. And the staff here insisted that their swifts be protected. They were nesting in old, very old ventilation holes, uh, which had rusted away. I think the metal ventilator grills had rusted away. Swifts had got in and were nesting inside. And the staff said, protect our swifts. And they spotted all the right holes. They got them fitted up with the EcoServe bricks. And there are now more swifts there than there were before. It's just lovely. Um, this is a sort of art and swifts project. It's a new housing, little, little, little housing block in Battersea, uh, just south of the Thames. And the, um, the, 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 the developer uh, wanted something really special for this site. And he, he in fact, it took ages. I mean, he, he came to see me um, and chatted to me and communicated with me um, for about three years. Um, over how to do it. And in the end, we, we designed, we told him what size they had to be, what size the holes had to be, um, how to play the calls. And he got nine apertures incorporated in the design with the right size holes. And he's playing swift calls, the little loudspeakers inside. And then he got an artist to carve all these wonderful swifts into the white brick here. And so it, it, it makes it into the swift building. I mean, it's just marvelous. It just looks absolutely great. And um, a friend of mine walks up and down, lives just down the road, and she says she can hear the swift calls as she goes past in the morning. So um, it's all working um, and just waiting for the first tenants. So it's, this sort of scheme is just lovely. It, 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 some developers are really good. Some developers are just unspeakable and some are really good. And you'll soon find out when you start working with people in the building trade, um, the, the nice ones and, and the dreadful ones. Um, I've worked with both and thank God for the nice ones because they make life, they might make life livable. And, um, and you'll find them when you start working in this, in this area, you'll find the nice ones and you'll know who you can trust and who will do lovely things like this. Um, this is our latest project. It's Battle Public Library in Sussex. And Dick Newell of Action for Swifts and I combined on this. We funded the Swift bricks that made by Dick Newell's company. He designed them. They are Britain's cheapest, neatest and lightest Swift brick, and they can be made to match any brick size, including Roman Italian brick sizes and any brick color. You just send a sample of the color or a good photograph and Dick will match it. Um, so these ones have got observation backs so that cameras can be set up inside the tower here. You can see they're just under this, this roof 
this witch's hat here. And so cameras can be set up to watch inside the boxes and relay the successful nesting, we hope, to people visiting the library. There'll be a monitor near the entrance so they can see the swifts. So great, it was just done a few months, uh, but two months ago, three months ago, it was done. So we're hoping, hoping, hoping that when they finish off renovating the library, swifts will find it and move in. Um, this is a huge one we did. This was involved about 90 swift nests, nesting in a Roman town, an ancient Roman town called Fulbourne, just outside Cambridge. Beautiful place. And it had loads of council buildings from the 1960s, which had loads of swifts in them. Amazingly, it got into these concrete prefabricated buildings. And when it was time for them to be knocked down and re renewed, the people in them said, that's lovely. We love the idea of a new house, but our Swifts must move with us. And we were commissioned to design to well, to do the strategy for moving the Swifts, i.e. do all the work when the Swifts were in Africa and have the new places ready for them when they came back. And we did it. And we did it by designing this dead simple, can be made by the site carpenter plywood box with a section of soil pipe, the cheapest possible sort of plastic pipe, and a rather more expensive Schwegler faceplate that lets in Swifts. And we sunk these inside the lofts the boxes are inside the lofts, the pipes pierce the insulation and they put the faceplate on the outside. Because it's a loft, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be so insulated as the lower areas. And the swifts moved back and once again, more swifts are nesting now in Fulbourne than ever nested before. Spain, we'll look at a few other countries. Spain, Avila, it's one of the most famous towns in Spain because it's got complete walls, one of the few walled cities in Europe with complete walls. You can walk them. You can walk right round the walls of Avila, and I've done so. And my friend Rosie Schultz from Hanover, she went round too. She alerted me to this. They did up, they repointed the walls, you can see all nicely repointed, but they left the holes for the Swifts. And there's a Swift bursting out of a hole and another Swift. And they put up signs telling all about the building process and the Swifts in English and in Spanish. And I, when you can visit again, go to Avila. It's great. It has got a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful walls, beautiful town, beautiful cathedral, nice food. So um, uh, 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 a great place to visit and see the Swifts. Go in the Swift time. It's just lovely. Spain. A lot of problems for Swifts in Spain. You've seen there's been a one third reduction in Spanish Swifts. Well, a lot of it is down to renovating old buildings. Spain has got the most incredible wealth of beautiful old buildings, like this block of flats. It would have been decrepit for years underinvested in, under maintained. It would have had loads of holes in it and Swifts would have got in, and geckos, and lizards, and black red stars, and lesser kestrels, and all sorts. All sorts would have been in these holes, and they're going, they're going, and it's causing problems, but sometimes intelligent, gifted, decent, kind, far thoughtful, far thinking people do things like this. They've designed the plinths for this, or they hold up the, they hold up these little sort of roofs over the windows. Um, they're designed to be hollow and they've got little swiftness holes in them. You see down here, the swift holes they've built and other things can use them too. A lot of other birds and reptiles like geckos can get in there and use them as well. And here we come to what they call the mushrooms, what they call the fungi, lacetas, mushrooms. And this was built on the, the site of the old slaughterhouses in Seville. And hey presto. 2,000 pallet swifts moved in and started nesting there. And I, 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 I was, um, I and several other European swift experts were asked to visit Seville to give support to the local wildlife groups who were trying to persuade the municipality to respect nesting swifts, nesting bats, everything that nested in the old buildings and to keep them, to keep them, to preserve them and not to force them out. And we were taken to this site at dusk. And I mean, the screaming was just incredible. And these pallid swifts look just like our swift, but sort of coffee colored, can hardly tell the difference. I mean, experts can tell different size, wingtips and slightly chubbier and different call, um, but it's, it's tough. And um, they would have swore whipping around here in the floodlighting, going in and out. They, they'd found some place they could nest in the joints 
that held this plywood structure together. It's the most amazing thing. I mean, if you go, you don't think it's plywood, you think it's concrete, but apparently it's finished plywood. Um, it's well worth it. Seville is fantastic anyway. It's fantastic for architecture, fantastic for history, fantastic for food and drink, and it's absolutely stunning for bird life. It's got thousands and thousands of swifts. It's got great bats. It's got lesser kestrels feeding on moths in the floodlights of the cathedral at night so after dinner you nip down to the cathedral and you wander around and you see lesser kestrels just just floating in the in 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 in, in the floodlights of the cathedral and snapping up moths it is the most incredible place i intend to go back there as soon as i can after lockdown Switzerland. This is my friend Bernard's house in Switzerland, where I mentioned earlier, I think that he's got something like 60 Swifts nesting in these Swiss made boxes. And you'll see that they've got little doors. Some of them have got little swing doors. Well, these doors are to stop sparrows getting in. Amazingly, these, these doors can be operated by Swifts. They can open them when they come back. Here you see the magnet and you see the door. When a swift comes back from migration, just knocks the door up, which a sparrow cannot do. So it doesn't get its nest taken over by sparrows. And they were set up only about nine, 10 years ago. And uh, wow, wow, boy, is he successful. And here is a motorway bridge job. Now I put this in specially because I've tried to get this done on English bridges road bridges. And I've been told by the highways agency, impossible. We can't do this. We need 24 hour, three, six, five days a year access to our bridges and we might disturb the breeding and be prosecuted. So we can't do this. Well, if they can do it in Switzerland, they can do it everywhere. And here we have a great line of nest boxes put up when the bridge was built using the same scaffolding and it works. And here is a nature reserve, which also has um, a nature reserve building nearby, which is covered in nest boxes for swifts and house martins. You can just slap these things up and just give it a go, give it a go. But wow, I mean, why our highways agency can't do this? Um, just miserable devils, if you ask me, just people who love to say no, don't want any trouble, don't want any bother, don't want any loonies. Um, let's just build a bridge. But why not? Why not? We've got them on. We've got nest boxes for swifts, alpine swifts on motorway bridges around Barcelona and all around Italy you'll find motorways, motorway bridges and elevated motorways have crag martin nests on them entirely naturally. So it can be done, they love the places. This is some, um, some just a few pictures from Wales to show perhaps you don't know about these. Um, this is in Barry, it's the Cadoxon Primary School, and they've used this ventilation tower, which ventilates the, 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 the building very neatly, a nice bit of Victorian ventilation architecture here. Lovely banded polychrome stone work here, uh, absolutely lovely bit of building, and look how solid it is and reliable. We have loads of Victorian schools, thriving in London, don't need to be replaced. Just keep using these lovely solid buildings, lovely and cool as the climate heats up. Uh, lovely thick stone walls, no damp course, so they're lovely and damp downstairs. Great, great to cope with too much heat. And here they've got swift nest boxes built into the ventilation tower. It's a good idea and a good place. Won't cause any problems at all. And here down in Cardiff, Cardiff Swift City, they have mapped their Swifts. This is essential if you're going to protect them. You have to know where they are. And then when building applications come in, planning applications come in, you're forewarned. You've got the information already there. Zurich did this in 1926 or 1929. The Zurich Town Council mapped all the birds living in Zurich's buildings in 1929, and they keep the information updated at the council. And if you put in a building application, they look it up and they say, oh, yes, you've got jackdaws, collared doves and swifts. You've got to protect them during the whole building process and put in new nest places if you're taking away the old ones. So if you've got the information, it's half, more than half, it's 90% of the battle. Swift projects elsewhere in Europe. Well, here we are. Uh, there's loads. There's loads. Some countries are blank on our map. 
For example, Russia, unfortunately, um, we know nothing going on in Russia. We know SWIFT experts in Russia, but we don't know of anything being done practically to help them. Um, uh, 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 we've we've also got places like like um, what's it called Bosnia. We know nothing going on in Bosnia, and in fact, in the former Yugoslavia, um, we 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 have talked to people in Croatia. We're in touch with the Croatians, but uh, they're only sort of beginning to get slightly worried now as the economy starts to boom and they start getting European money for doing things up. Um, yeah, but. Denmark, Ireland, Gibraltar, Israel, Italy, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, and Sweden are all doing stacks, actually. And here is a nest box scheme at a shopping center in southern Denmark. So um, uh, uh, all I can say is add your own. And when you go on holiday, talk to people, talk to people, talk to local people, meet the local bird watchers, talk to them. What how nice if you go on holiday somewhere, just get in touch with the local bird watching group. I do it all over the place. I, I, I go on to Birding Pal and I meet the local birders and we have a lovely chat and a lovely afternoon tea or morning coffee or evening drink and we see some birds and we talk to them about what we do and why. I've got stacks of European UK Swift contacts. If you need a contact anywhere to swap ideas with, if you've seen something in this presentation that or tickles your fancy and you want to know more, get in touch with me at Swift Conservation. Um, you'll find contact, just go to the website and you'll find contact facilities there. Get in touch with me, that's Rosie Schultz in Hanover, and it's a place for sparrows and co. And they're putting them into the integrated, putting nest places, uh, they're putting nest, nest places for birds and bats in the insulation, in the integrated insulation on this project. If you like that idea, want to know more about it, want to talk to Rosie, just get in touch with me, I'll put you in touch. Please support urban biodiversity. It can be done. It's all doable. It's all low tech, very simple. You don't need high tech solutions. You don't need pumped water green walls. You just need ivy and creepers, rambling roses, honeysuckle. You don't need to go high tech. You don't need to go mad. You don't need an architect. You just need a little help from a few key people and you can do this. St Paul's Cathedral seen from a nearby green roof. It's the roof of a top legal company, Eversheds. And they went and saw a chap who runs London's green roof place. Uh, green Roof Organization, and he came along and he got them to put down just crushed brick. I don't think it's any more than crushed brick and plants moved in on the wind and took it over. And you can see some pools and you can see all these lovely insects and birds whipping around. It's pretty good, actually. The river's right nearby, so you get extra species coming in and resting on the rooftops. A uh, commonest bird locally is the yellow, is the lesser black-backed gull, actually quite an unusual bird and it thrives in the city of London. And on that note, I will leave you. Thank you very much indeed. I'll be happy to deal with any questions if I can, if there are any. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Edward. That was, that was fantastic. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of buzzing with with ideas and inspiration, and uh, that's been a fantastic whirlwind tour of uh, of urban biodiversity and Swift, as as we said, and uh, great stuff. Um, Thank you. So I'm just going to. I think we'll just jump in straight away with some of the questions that we've had through the through from the audience, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Football starts at eight, you know. Yeah, what football? I, just, I don't know what you're talking about. So. Um, I will, uh, well, we, we, we will perhaps be supporting Denmark since they knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, both. I, I live in this flat, and the the, the two two adjacent neighbours have got their Italian flags out, so <laughs> I'm in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> We'll move away from football. And Far away. We'll go to the much easier topic of uh, climate change. And um, there's a question here uh, from, from Dave's iPad. And it says, um, climate change is surely going to affect their numbers, especially in this country. Do you have any thoughts on that, Edward? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's, there's climate change and there's climate change. The, 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 the heating aspect... Uh, the global warming aspect, it does not seem to be having any direct effect on Swift's migration patterns or timing. 
They seem to be sticking to the same timetable and sticking to the same routes. We don't see any changes yet, but individual weather events, the, the, the increasing severity of storms, um, hailstorms, bad weather, sudden bursts of prolonged cold wet weather are taking their toll on migrating birds. Uh, we've had several incidents in the past few years of mass deaths of swifts and hirundines on migration when they get caught out by a sudden burst of bad weather. So say the weather's quite nice in Spain. They fly over the Pyrenees and on the other side of the Pyrenees, it's snowing or hailing. There's terrible rainy weather because of the winds. They can't head back to Spain and get back over the mountains and because they're running short of food. Remember, they've just migrated from the Congo with a refueling stop in Liberia and then another one in Morocco, but they are in worn out condition and they may be very dehydrated and very low on fuel reserves, on fat reserves by the time they get back to us. And so as they're crossing, say, France and the weather's dire, they are going to drop out of the sky dead or they are going to cling to buildings to get out of the rain overnight and be found dead in the morning. Um, you get these terribly distressing incidents. There was a very bad one last year in Thessalonica when, I mean, literally swifts and swallows were just raining dead out of the sky. Um, they just come to the end. They couldn't go any further. They were too cold, too wet and too starving. And that is seems to be getting more frequent. So the, the, the slow increase of temperatures overall, like we said, this summer, is the hottest on record, it's two degrees more than it was 10 years ago. Uh, that does not appear to be particularly relevant as yet to Swift's migration. What is very relevant is severe weather, so changes in severe weather patterns. And that is having, a, 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 I think, a, a spectacular effect. Uh, I, I cannot say what it is in overall numbers because we don't know yet. And when you do get these mass deaths of swifts hitting the countryside, well, they're going to be hoovered up by foxes and badgers and stray dogs and wolves pretty quickly. Um, you're not going to find them all, so we don't know the numerical effect yet, but we do know that swifts are declining by five to six percent a year in the UK, maybe the same, maybe more elsewhere, and that we are getting increasing severe weather events and we're seeing swifts die. But that's the answer. Thanks, Edward. Um, yeah, uh, just just talking about the rates of decline uh, in Wales, the, the figures we think are even worse for decline in Wales. We've got 72% decline since, yeah. since the mid 90s, which yeah. makes them yeah. as, as declined as Greenfinch, which basically had a, a pandemic. So it's, it's yeah. a pretty really dire picture in Wales. Um, there's a very practical question here, and I thought, I thought it'd be interesting to ask you it, because I get asked it quite a lot when I'm trying to promote the idea of nest boxes. Yep. Something that people often ask is, um, this is from Sheila Lloyd. She says, Edward, thank you very, very much for a very informative talk. With the boxes under the guttering, how do they clean them when the Swifts have left? Oh, right, you don't need to clean a Swifts box. That's one of the first thing, you, 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 you've got blue tits or sparrows or something, yeah you'll have to clean the box out, but with Swifts you don't. And the reasons are several. First of all, the adult Swifts do not defecate in the box normally. The female defecates once before laying each egg, and that's it. Um, she might lay two or three eggs. Uh, secondly, with the chicks droppings, the adults eat every dropping they tread on. We've seen this with CCTV. We've watched Swifts in the box with CCTV. If they tread on a Swifts, on a chick's dropping, they just eat it. We don't know why. It may be to recycle essential minerals, but minerals, we just don't know why, but they do that. Which means the boxes are about the cleanest bird boxes you're ever going to see. And then the other thing is that the Swifts nest is made from material caught in the air. Remember, swifts don't land. So to make the nest, they go through the sky picking up thistle down, twi little tiny twigs, leaves, petals, anything that they can catch in the air. 
um, feathers, an awful lot of feathers going, feral pigeon feathers here in London going to swift nests and it's seagull feathers at the seaside I've seen. Um, they pick the feathers up in the air, blowing around, and then they stick them together with saliva. Now, that makes a highly edible nest. The saliva is full of protein, the feathers, you can eat feathers if you're certain sorts of insects. Um, and so whilst it, all the time the nest is there, various insects like carpet beetles and clothes moths, and that family of domestic beetles, uh, will be in the nest eating it. If a temperature is above 20 degrees centigrade, these, these insects will breed. Below 20 degrees centigrade, the activity slows down markedly and it's non-existent during winter. But all the rest of the time, um, these insects will be eating up the nest. So by the time the next breeding season comes around, there's no, often nothing much left of the nest and the swifts have to build it up the next year. So you have very clean nest boxes if you have swifts. No need to clean them at all. And in fact, the chances of you're breaking your neck trying to clean a swift nest box are so high, I would just, I mean, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't start climbing ladders. I mean, get the nest box up and leave it. And that's it. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Edward. Um, there's a few questions coming in along the same sort of lines, which is to do with the height of buildings. Um, do they need to be a certain height to to put swift bricks on the sounds like there's people that are interested in getting bricks. yeah yeah i mean well, saying, I, you know, I wouldn't do it long. lower than i wouldn't do it lower than four or five meters about four or five meters it depends what's next door i mean if next door is very close then you really want that box up a bit higher if next door's a long way away then four or five meters is probably fine you've got to look at it sort of holistically um in urban areas every aspect of your house is going to be shaded or likely to be quite near another building. So you really want to choose the freest aspect uh, and that gives the Swifts the best possible flight space. They can use narrow spaces, but um, you don't want to make it too difficult. And you really, you're, I mean, Swifts have been seen nesting down to two meters and they've been seen nesting up to 80 meters but by and large they don't by and large they're nesting between like five meters and 25 meters so you really want to stick with your highest possibilities and you don't want um, them slap bang to next door because they probably won't find the holes you want them a bit further out so they get uh, swifts flying past can spot a likely hole um so really, I'd say four or five meters up and try and get a bit of space around it. And again, you don't want it too wet, too windy, too cold or too hot. So, um, you know, work within that remit and try and choose somewhere fairly cozy. You can download a little leaflet from my website that gives you the basic information. It's, it's, it's called Swift Information for Homeowners. I recommend it and, and in fact it, it kind of would answer a few of the other questions that have come up on the, the practicalities of swift boxes in particular. Um, I wondered if I could ask a slightly sort of well woollier question really. I, I was really interested in you know when you were talking about urban greening and trying to persuade people to have a different vision of, um, of you know of, of, of urban space and particularly of you know with, with swifts in mind. Um, and I, you know, I was interested in basically you're talking about it changing people's aesthetics, aren't you? Because it, it's a way, in a way, it, we want to try and get people to to value things which are not necessarily tidy, but are but are beautiful. And and I think that's a, always a bit of a challenge because we have very established views, or some people, you know, we tend to have established views about what's beautiful and what's tidy and that kind of thing. Um, and you know, if people don't have the opportunity to come and hear you talk. How can we do that? You know, and if we're not, if we're not, um, you know, Lenin or Napoleon, how do we get people to, as a, as a, as groups and as organisations, how do we sort of shift that that perception of what's beautiful and what's valuable? Um, it's a big question, isn't it? I don't really expect you to answer that in in two minutes, but just oh well, I'll I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go. I mean, one personal example. Um, just work on your house and your garden to make them exactly as you want. I'll give you an example. Some, some friends of mine 
live in Portugal. And no, hang on, northern Spain, northern Spain. And they told me that they had been obliged to hose the house martin nests off their house because everybody else in the village hosed their house martin nests off their house and told them these are nasty dirty things you've got to wash the nests off your house now i at the risk of being perhaps unpopular or seen as mad um i would have said to them oh no 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 these birds eat the mosquitoes these birds eat the gnats these birds are friendly these birds are good i can sleep with my windows open at night i don't need an air conditioner because they will be eating up the mosquitoes and these birds uh, uh, we say at home in england the, uh, if you have house martins on your house they bring you good luck now that might be a total lie but i've invented a new myth and you just you just have to do that sort of thing this is the bird that brings you good luck i've heard I've heard another one, I heard one the other day, house martins only nest where there are happy people. You, you've got to make up these myths and then live them and be an example. You've got to say, wow, I've got all these wonderful creatures in the garden that eat up all the mosquitoes. They keep me company. I listen to the babies in the nest at night and I don't need sleeping pills. They lull me to sleep. I mean, that's true. That's true. I've done that. I've, I've stayed in a pub once where I had the window open at night and um, there were house martins outside and the sound was fantastic. I lay there and they just lulled me to sleep so you've you've got to you've got to just be a walking example a bit like the ancient mariner he goes around everywhere this dead bird around his neck and tells everybody the terrible story but you've got to tell people the good story you've got to become a walking apostle for wildlife and biodiversity and you can change things i mean fashions change incredibly fast um for example um for example, uh, I mean, uh, to my amazement, a dog which thrived when I was a teenager in the 60s, the apricot miniature poodle, which I never thought I'd ever see again, has suddenly started appearing in huge quantities in London. I see several every day. Fashion has come back. And people do like putting up bird boxes and they do like feeding the birds. So extend that extend that passion for bird boxes in the garden that passion i mean rspb sells i don't know a million tons of bird seed a year yeah yeah people love doing that extend it to their houses start off with the ones that have the bird feeders and the bird boxes on a tree or something and say how about getting some swifts onto your house and then make that fashionable and make that desirable oh, well, it's working already. When I started, there wasn't a single English manufacturer of swift nest boxes. And that's just 20 years ago. Not one. Now there may be a dozen companies or more making swift nest boxes here in the UK. There's half a dozen making swift bricks. There's several, I sell swift calls. There's several other people selling swift calls and swift call equipment. It's, 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 it, it is, it is, it's, it's money. It is making money for British businesses. So as an Irish manufacturer of Swift Nest Boxes now, and there's now, I've encouraged people in France to get going and there's a French concrete company churning out Swift Nest Boxes. I'm trying to do the same in Italy as well because they've got loads of brick companies and they could easily make Swift bricks, but um, it is starting to work. So really you've got to get going. You've just got to be a walking apostle and do it yourself, encourage people, be an example. That's it easy <laughs> fantastic yeah just do it i think that, that's a that's a wonderful uh, philosophy and thank you for that um there's a few other general questions about how can people set up groups or how people get advice and um i think you know really the the, the answer to a lot of those is to is to contact swift conservation or to contact you directly but go to go to swift conservation and also action for swift because action for swift and also swift local network yes, it's a google a google discussion group and they, it it holds together all the groups in the uk which they are now 90 and if you need advice they can help too but get in touch with me by all means and i can put you in the right direction yeah and swift local network will also tell you of the nearest uh, swift group to you so if you if you want to get yep. some local advice that's really yep 
That's yep. Good. But the important thing is just 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 get going. Get yeah. going. It's like everything else in life. It's all daunting at first. It's like buying a house or starting a new job. It's all terribly frightening at first, but you can do it. Loads of other people have. You can do it too. Absolutely. And and if it's to do with what you know, wider um, wildlife stuff, then you know, there's always uh, well, North Wales Wildlife Trust here in, in North Absolutely. Wales. Absolutely. Wildlife Trusts all over the country. And Absolutely. Sure Absolutely. That, yeah, yeah, there's wildlife trusts. There's all sorts of uh, local groups that are keen on parks and wildlife, um, keen on um, wild swimming, add concern for water. You, you, can, you can get mobilised loads of people who, little do they know it, wild swimmers want to swim somewhere wild they don't want to swim somewhere dead so yeah you can get together with lots of people and act together yeah absolutely well i, I think that's um that's fantastic edward and uh, well i think i just i just want to say again a big um as we say in wales thank you from the heart it's been a fantastic and you know very heartening uh talk and it's it's inspired me i think it's i'm sure it's inspired lots of the other people that have joined us today um and uh yeah and just want to say go out and enjoy the rest of swift awareness week and go out and uh see some swifts i'm gonna shoot off now and, and look at some swifts in bangor with some young people brilliant and, um, yeah i think it's been a wonderful evening thank you everybody no thank you for inviting me it's lovely to get these opportunities and i mean covid has turned me into uh, person who does it all by the internet it'd be so nice to actually get out and talk to people again but i'm getting loads of talks loads of people are interested people have turned covid into a big opportunity for wildlife and swifts it's brilliant yeah fantastic and we'll get you over here in the flesh at some point excellent excellent i'd love that yeah some of our swifts here so um, Edward, thank you, everybody. And bye bye, everybody. Thanks, thanks for participating. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.